Check, check. Okay, can everybody hear me all right? Okay. Great. Got all kinds of wires. Come on in. How's everyone doing this morning? Okay. All right. I'm doing well. Thank you. I was watching the clock. I was listening to Aaron's sermon. I was being blessed by Aaron's sermon. And I was watching the clock. And I was thinking, the benediction's coming at 10 o'clock. I can feel it. Okay. If you haven't noticed... There is a handout coming in. Those of you all coming in, be sure to pick up a handout. I started putting them on chairs, but I didn't know who was coming in twos and ones. And, and so if you don't have a handout, they're right in the back. So social distance your way back to a handout. Um, it's exciting to start Sunday school. It's wonderful to see all of you. Uh, if I haven't met you, I'm Carlton Wynn. I'm the new guy around here, and uh, it's been a delight. Um, my wife, Lindley, and I are just increasingly thrilled and thankful to be here. Um, why don't I open with a word of prayer? Uh, if anyone's watching online, I don't know if anyone is, but hello online. Uh, why don't I open with a word of prayer, and then we'll get oriented to the class. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for this day that you have made. May we rejoice and be glad in it. Father, we pray as we come to your word, having worship, preparing to worship, that you would unite our hearts to fear your name. Uh, Lord, may we behold wonderful things in your law as we lift our eyes to Christ. uh, Lord, we pray that his spirit would fill us and illumine our hearts and our minds, that we might be, as we just sang, drawn ever nearer to you through our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for one another and for this opportunity in these strange circumstances to gather together in this way. Would you bless this class uh, this morning and in the weeks ahead? In Jesus' name, amen. Well, you can see on your handout... Uh, The title of this Sunday School class is The Privileges of the Christian Life. And I just want to say a couple of words about that title. And I know I have to be efficient here because we only have until 1045. At which point, let me just warn you, I'm going to have to scoot out of here to prepare for the next uh, service. So I apologize. I won't be able to linger and chat as much as I would love to. Uh, So anyway... Uh, The Privileges of the Christian Life. Why this subject? Well, let me give you three reasons uh, in ascending order of importance. Uh, The first reason is it's very flexible. (laughs) Uh, We don't know what's going to happen with Sunday School. And so I wanted a topic that could be uh, self-contained week to week. Now, these classes are going to build on one another week to week a bit. But generally speaking, if you miss a Sunday school class, you're not going to be lost. Uh, Each each lesson is designed to be relatively self-contained. And uh, and hopefully this subject will last us at least until Christmas. Theoretically. Theoretically. It could go on forever. Right? But we won't make it go on forever. Don't worry. Uh, Number two. this This is a... may resonate with you. There, there is a broader social, cultural conversation going on uh, related to privilege. And uh, race relations are a part of this. Um, politics are certainly a part of this. I'm not going to engage that debate, which is an important one, 
There are very important worldview issues at stake, and we need to view all things under the light of God's word, thoughtfully, carefully, lovingly. But in light of that broader mainstream cultural conversation, I wanted this class to be an opportunity where we lift our eyes beyond earthly privileges to the privileges that are ours in Christ, to our heavenly privileges that all believers share as one body in union with Christ. And so that, that's a little bit of a part of the rationale for this class. And then thirdly, entirely aside from the cultural conversation, there is embedded in the human heart a tendency, I think you'll agree, to focus on our immediate circumstances. Uh, there's a tendency for us to drift into a preoccupation with what we have, with the way our immediate circumstances are going, and engage our daily satisfaction in light of those things, rather than the eternal heavenly realities that are ours today through the gospel. And so I want us to fight the temptation to live our lives according to our immediate circumstances and understand that in our immediate circumstances are eternal truths that we would do well to remember day by day. Uh, the meditation before the service this morning was from 2 Corinthians 4, looking not only to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. Looking not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are temporary or transient. The things that are unseen are eternal. We have a tendency, do we not, to look to those seen and transitory things. So this is an exercise in looking to the unseen and eternal things that are true of us in the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, as we select a particular privilege or benefit or feature of the Christian life, I want it to be really practical for us. And so each week I want to ask, how is this a privilege for the Christian? What, what impact should this make upon our lives? What is the liability of forgetting this privilege of the Christian life? or diminishing it in our minds and hearts. And so we're going to do that with our subject today. Uh, the privilege I want to consider with you this morning is the ark privilege. It's the uber privilege. It's the privilege of privileges. It's the privilege in terms of which come to us every other privilege we will be considering in this class. And we only have 30 minutes to consider it. <laughs> but it is the privilege... I say here, of knowing God. Now, this is a massive topic. Knowing God is not like knowing anything else. Uh, many of you are in school, have been in school. Uh, any, any subject that we seek to study, we generally, as it were, take the step forward to investigate it. Uh, we are the ones who are actively considering that subject as a as an object of our consideration. But with God, things are different. Because with God, we do not so much investigate Him. We could say, biblically, that He is the one who investigates us. Indeed, God is the one, if we are to know Him at all, who must take the initiative and take a step toward us, creating us, and then revealing himself to us. In weeks to come, we'll realize uh, the blessing of Scripture, the blessing of God's revelation, because if God did not reveal himself to us, we would not know him. And so we need to recognize at the outset that knowing God is, is a unique thing. J.I. Packer has this famous book, Knowing God, I heard a rumor that uh, Margaret DeBoard is going to be doing a study of this book. It's a wonderful book. J.I. Packer wrote this, oh, 70s, something like that. Uh, this 73. Never knowing it was going to be as popular as it became. Uh, after all, who would want to buy a book, a Christian book on, on the study of God? Turns out it sold millions of copies. Uh, one of the greatest evangelical Christian biblical books you can have. In that book, he quotes Charles Spurgeon. You can see on your handout. Let me just read it for us. Spurgeon says, God is a subject so vast 
that all our thoughts are lost in its immensity. So deep that our, pri- that our pride is drowned in its infinity. Yet nothing will, s- w- will so enlarge the intellect, nothing so magnify the whole soul of man as devout, earnest, continued investigation of the great subject of the deity. That's undoubtedly true. Uh, studying who God is is a marvelous privilege of the Christian life. But what I want you to notice here at the beginning of our study is that this quote, and ultimately Packer's book, is, uh, is directed not so much at knowing about God, but, but knowing God. There's a difference between knowing about God and knowing God. Both are great. You won't ever hear me denigrate the study of God's attributes or character because in knowing about God, Lord willing, we come to know him. But the ultimate reason you should study about God is that you might know God himself, that you might know him as your God, that you might know him personally and know yourself as his child. So, so the privilege we're talking about today is the privilege of knowing God experientially and vitally and personally because of his self-revelation to us. It is, in fact, knowing God in the sense of having fellowship with God. If you were in the early service, or if you're going to be in the next service, just what Aaron was talking about at the end of his sermon knowing and growing in the grace and knowledge of God through Christ. As we'll see, this fellowship knowledge of God is found in terms of a covenant, a covenant that God makes with man. We'll get to that in a little bit later. What I want you to see for now on your handout is that the Old Testament frequently uses the language of knowing in this very personal and experiential way. We as Westerners typically think of knowledge as just sort of this sterile, abstract thing, but not so in the Old Testament. Think, for example, of the very earthy description of knowledge in Genesis 4.1. If that's on your handout, Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain. Okay, this is the one flesh knowledge, but notice the Hebrew mind uses the word knowing here. Well, the New Testament picks up on this Old Testament experiential, personal, vital knowledge concept and it, and it elevates it. And it directs this kind of knowledge to our relationship with God as the highest blessing of all. This too was mentioned this morning in worship, John 17, 3. And this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Or 2 Corinthians 4, 6. Paul talks about um, the, the renewal of the heart in the new birth. And Paul is struggling for some kind of analogy uh, to capture the, the explosive supernatural power of God implanting his saving word in your heart. And the only analogy that's fitting is creation itself from the very beginning. And so he harks back to Genesis 1 and he says, For God who said, Let light shine out of darkness, has shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So, knowing God, this is the greatest Uh, most glorious privilege of the Christian life. It is the heartbeat of the Christian life. It is the essence of our religion. It is the fundamental theme of all of Scripture. It is the privilege in which all other Christian privileges come to us. Okay, just just moving forward, I want you to know that I I, I don't want to be the only one talking here. We do have limited time, but if you, I'll pause for questions and comments along the way, so don't be shy and I will try to get to know you through your eyeballs and uh, try to hear you as best we can. Okay, let's move on to Roman numeral two. There is a fascinating way 
that the Westminster Confession of Faith speaks about knowing God in this climactic, experiential, personal way. Chapter 7 of this document, and for those of you who are not familiar with it, this is a 17th century confession of faith, 33 chapters. And uh, this is what our church, uh, in terms of the leadership of our church, the, the officers and pastors, our denomination, we believe that this is, this is a great expression of what the Bible teaches. So, so Bible is our ultimate authority, but the Westminster Confession of Faith we speak of as a secondary authority. Uh, we believe the Bible, but we believe this is what we mean when we say we believe the Bible. So, chapter 7 in the Westminster Confession of Faith is on God's covenant with man. Again, more to come on that one. But the very first section of chapter 7 on God's covenant with man says this. There's a lot here. We're going to zero in on one phrase. The distance between God and the creature is so great that although reasonable creatures do owe obedience unto him as their creator. Okay, let me just pause right there. Sorry to interrupt you. Let's just pause and remember, what is it talking about when it says the distance between God and the creature is so great? Well, it's not a physical distance. Can anyone just tell me why, why is it not a physical distance between God and the creature? Anybody want to give it a shot? God is everywhere. Heard something over here? He's omnipresent. The children's catechism. Maybe some of you have heard this. God is a spirit and has not a body like man. Very good. God is a spirit and has not a body like man. There is no where when we speak of God's presence. He's not confined within space. He fills all space and yet, mysteriously, he's not confined to any space. And so the distance here is not a not a spatial distance, not a physical distance. We could say it's a distance in being. It's a, it's a distance in kind. God is God, and we are his creatures. If we were to draw this, just a little schematic for us, you could do this. Top circle represents God, and the bottom circle represents creation. Notice the top circle is not part of the lower circle. We don't believe that part of creation is God. We don't have one circle where there's God and creation. No. One circle thinking is not Christian thinking. We need to be two circle, I've got to get in the frame here, we've got to be two circle thinking Christians. God is God, and then distinct from God is everything that he has made. And guess what? That's everything. <laughs> there are only two kinds of things in this cosmos. Well, the cosmos is the creation, and then there's the God who made it. We can call this the creator, creature, distinction. Not very fancy, but it's accurate. The creator-creature distinction. That is what the confession's talking about from the outset of Westminster Confession 7.1. The distance between God and the creature is so great. Implication? That although reasonable creatures, that is, creatures made as his image, it's principally talking about man here, male and female, do owe obedience unto him as their creator. Pause right there. Got to keep my eye on the clock. Simply by virtue of being a creature, we owe God obedience. An implication of the creator-creature distinction is that he is the potter and we are the clay, and we owe our creator 
worship and obedience and thanks. And by the way, let me just say parenthetically, this is not a violation of who we are. This is what we were made for. So the implication that we owe God obedience and worship and praise is not something that, that strips the gears of who you are. It is what you were made to do. And the fact that we think it conflicts with who we are is actually a function of sin, not a function of our being creatures. Okay, got to keep going. Although reasonable creatures owe obedience unto him as their creator, yet they could never have any fruition of him as their blessedness and reward, but by some voluntary condescension on God's part, which he hath been pleased to express by way of covenant. There is such glory in that statement. And I encourage you to consider it maybe this afternoon. Just sit and read this over again. But what's it saying? It's saying that though we as God's creatures owe obedience unto him, simply by virtue of being creature, we could not have any fruition of God as our blessedness and reward, except God take an additional step towards us. Uh, the text says that he condescends. He voluntarily offers himself as our blessedness and reward through covenant. So, just to recap, and I know we're moving a little too quickly here. God owes us nothing as our creator. We owe God everything as his creatures. But over against that relationship, that relationship notwithstanding, God himself is pleased to offer himself to us as our blessedness and reward. Now, this morning we have to hold off on the reward language. And I want to zero in with you on blessedness. This is what I'm talking about when we speak about knowing God. Knowing God as our blessedness. What does this mean? What does it mean? Well, you hear the word blessing in there. Let me just give you a quick story. We uh, lived up in Pennsylvania, as you know, uh, up outside Philadelphia, and I had an opportunity to preach at a few churches in the area. And there was a church in Long Island, New York. Okay, Now, I'm from Texas. I had never been to Long Island, New York. But I was preaching at a church there, and I was making my way through all the tolls that's another way of life in the Northeast, those of you who know. Uh, you have to pay a lot of money to drive on the roads. So I was making my way to uh, Long Island, New York, and uh, thankfully, my uh, side of the highway was, was very clear. But the other side was totally backed up. I mean, bumper to bumper. So I'm cruising down the road to this church, and a little white car, I still remember, just zips right in front of me. Didn't cut me off, just zips right in front of me. And the license plate of this white car said, blessed. <laughs> and I thought to myself, is this what it means to be blessed by God? That the other side of the highway is bumper to bumper traffic, and I'm cruising down the highway, I'm blessed. Sometimes we can think that this is what it means to be blessed, that, that God parts the traffic and makes everything smooth in my life. But friends, that is not what it means biblically to be blessed by God. To be blessed by God, or more specifically, to have God as our blessedness is something deeper and richer than having an easy life. What does it mean? Well, we can put it in different ways. To have God as our blessedness, we could say, means to have God's presence and protection and his power suffusing our relationship of peace with him. It means to have God as our God and to have us be his people. It, it means to be, to be carried to the limits 
of our knowledge and our love and our enjoyment of God. Uh, in terms of the relationship between God and the creature, it means that God actually takes an interest in and delights in his people. Delights to give himself to his people. And we, in turn, delight to give ourselves back to him in true fellowship. This is what it means to have God as our blessedness. To commune with God. Gerhardus Voss, in this wonderful sermon that he gives, um, well, if you have your Bible, I'll just do this very quickly. The, the sermon in which this quote comes from is from Hosea. Hosea chapter 14. Let's see. Does anyone have their Bible open? Michelle, you have your Bible? Okay, Michelle, people listening may not be able to hear you, but I, I want you to read Isaiah 14, verse 8. If you could read it as loudly as possible for us. Okay, thank you. Did you hear that last line? God says, I am like an evergreen cypress. From me comes your fruit. This is a beautiful picture of God communing with his people, that all of our goodness, all of our delight, all of our fruitfulness is from God out of his fullness and out of his fruitfulness. And Voss speaks to this verse, and he says, the fruition of God consists in the reception by us of his likeness into ourselves so that the, his beauty of character becomes literally our own. So close and so precious an identification no other love can dream of and no other union attain. In it the fruit and the tree become one. We feel and taste that the Lord is for our delight. What a beautiful way of putting it. The Bible actually um, speaks of this mutual delight and fellowship again and again and again. Let me just read a couple of verses here on your handout. God's covenant with Abraham. He says, And I will establish my covenant between you, between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. What is the substance of God's covenant? It is that he would be our God and we would be his people. Leviticus 26 then hints at how this is going to come about. How is it that God becomes our God and takes us as his people? God says in Leviticus 26, And I will walk among you and will be your God, and you shall be my people. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt that you should not be their slaves. What I like about Leviticus 26 is that it hints that, that taking God as our God and his taking us as his people is going to come through a great act of redemption. This is how God becomes our blessedness and reward in the wake of sin. God here mentions redemption from the land of Egypt. But of course we know that God's redemption from the land of Egypt was not the ultimate act of redemption. That was just a foretaste. It was, a, it was an anticipation of the great act of redemption to come. Okay, one more text, and I'm going to skip over the quote from uh, Thomas Brooks. I encourage you to read that. One more quote, uh, one more text from Exodus chapter 33. The context here, what's the context here? Moses has gone up to meet the Lord on Mount Sinai. We've already had the golden calf incident. Um, back in Exodus 33, 13, Moses says um, that he has found favor in God's sight. Uh, he has declared that God knows his name. Moses is basking in the unique fellowship that he has with God as the, as the leader of Israel. 
as the mediator between God and Israel, anticipating Christ. Moses is asking God in the wake of the golden calf incident to come with his people into the promised land. Moses doesn't want to go alone. In fact, if you have your Bibles, in, in verse 13, Moses says, Now therefore, if I have found favor in your sight, please, now, please show me now your ways that I may know you in order to find favor in your sight. Consider, too, that this nation is your people. He's saying, God, don't leave your people in a lurch. And God said to him, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. Now, what's interesting about verse 14 is that the word you there is in the singular. God is just about finished with his people. And he's telling Moses, hey, I'll go with you and I'll make out of you a great nation. And then what does Moses say? If your presence does not go with me, do not bring us up from here. For how shall it be known that I have found favor in your sight, I and your people? Is it not in your going with us so that we are distinct, I and your people, from every other people on the face of the earth? So Moses is pleading with the Lord to come with his people despite their deserving, their undeserving. And here, verse 17, the Lord said to Moses, this very thing that you have spoken, I will do. For you have found favor in my sight, and I know you by name. Now, ultimately, it's not because of Moses' righteousness. It's because Moses is anticipating Christ's righteousness that God goes with his people. Okay, all that's prelude. Verse 18, Moses said, Please show me your glory. Now, this word glory is a word that refers to the essence of who God is. Moses is like, uh, to put it kind of bluntly, Moses is asking for the moon here. <laughs> He's got, he, God has agreed to go with the people into the land, and Moses says, ah, just, just one more thing. Show me your glory. Show me the essence of who you are, God. And what does God say? He says, I will make all my goodness pass before you and proclaim before you my name, the Lord, and I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. But, he said, you cannot see my face, for no man shall see me and live. And the Lord said, Behold, there is a place by me where you shall stand on the rock, and while my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft of the rock, and I will cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will take away my hand, and you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. Okay, here's the point. Moses was not able to see the full glory of God because only one who can stand in the very presence of God knows his glory. And this is a text, I think, that's pointing us to the one who in his divine identity always sees his Father's face. He dwells in perfect harmony with the Father and the Holy Spirit who knows the heart of the Father as he is one God with the Father. And it is this one who has come from the Father and taken on flesh and revealed the Father to us such that we can know God as our blessedness and our reward. This is exactly what Peter says Christ has come to do to redeem us from sin for the ultimate purpose of knowing God. Look at 1 Peter 3.18. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God. So important for us to recognize that Jesus did not live and die and rise just so we could be forgiven. We often think to ourselves, what's the gospel? And we think, well, the gospel is that Jesus died for my sins so that I could be forgiven. And that's certainly wonderfully biblically true. But Jesus died to forgive you of your sins and make you more holy and make you a child of God. Notice, for a more ultimate purpose. He did this 
and is remaking you now into his image so that you might be fit for everlasting communion with God, that he might bring us to God. Ephesians 2 talks about how we were without God in the world. The implication is now that Christ has come, we have God as our God. Okay, I know we're running out of time here. Let me just pause for a moment and see if there are any questions before we talk about implications of this. Any thoughts or questions that come to mind from any of these texts? I know we have a little bit larger group. You may be hesitant to ask any questions or comment, but I'm very eager to hear anything that's on anyone's mind. Okay, well, let's, let's think through uh, just some implications here. Before I give you mine, what, what might be some implications of the privilege of knowing God as our blessedness? that you think would be useful in the Christian life. Any thoughts? Arnie? Hope. Hope. Hope Having a certain hope for the future. That that, That eternal life that has begun now and will carry on into eternity is a life of of knowing God, having fellowship with God. Very good. Very good. Anything else? Let me ask you this. How, How might this privilege correct some, maybe some, some ways of thinking in the church? Are there, any, are there any patterns that we fall into that this might help correct? Yes. To live without fear. Without fear. Okay, can you work that out for us? Well, yes. Very good. Yes, to talk to God without fear of retribution. God is the one who's given himself to us as our God. Uh, so we can speak freely to him. We can share our hearts with him. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. God, God didn't say, whoa, whoa, whoa. There's only a limit to the knowledge that you can have of me. Yeah. Yeah. Let me be clear that this knowledge of God, we don't, we don't bypass the mind here. I'm not talking about a, um, a kind of mysticism that's just sort of a non-rational experience. Please don't hear me say that. We, we come to know God by knowing about him in his word. But the point we want to make is that that all of our learning about God, all of our study of God's word is unto fellowship knowledge with God. So we don't bypass theology and understanding. Rather, we want to suffuse that study and that understanding with the ultimate goal of knowing him and enjoying God forever, right? Okay, yes, one more. Amen. Amen. To have God as our God means to have him as our friend and our lifelong companion, no doubt about it. Well, I have just a couple here, and I know we're going to have to close pretty soon. I, I have here, number one, if you're a Christian, if you believe in Christ, then you have God as your blessedness today. This is not something that awaits Christ's return. When Christ returns, it will mark the consummation forever of having God as your blessedness. But to be a Christian is to have God as your blessedness today. Eternal life starts today. Number two, I've already said this, don't have a bare intellectual view of your knowledge of God. Uh, Have an experiential view of your theology. Know about him in order to know him. And you can read that quote from Calvin. And then um, number three, seek to grow. 
Seek to grow in your fellowship with God. This is, this is why we do what we do, right? This is, this is why we have the ordinary means of grace, that we might fight sin and grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then, finally, the only way that we can have fellowship with God is through the person of Jesus Christ. Th- there is no other way to have God as our blessedness than coming through the person of Jesus. He is the one who brings God to us because he is God. And he, as our Savior and representative, brings us to God. So we can delight in him and we can worship and know the true and living God uh, by his mediation. Well, uh, this was a start. And we will continue. We will grow more comfortable in the classroom and with this routine. And I pray that it would be a blessing to you. Let me close in prayer. Father, thank you for uh, the knowledge that you give to us of yourself through the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you that this is not just, just bare intellectual knowledge, but this is, this is the knowledge of you as, the, as our Lord. As the King of all, as the Lord of creation, yes, but as our saving, loving, keeping, redeeming God. Father, I pray that we would treasure this great privilege with all that we are and that it would be our desire that others might know you and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Bless us now as we go from this place and would you use uh, our study together to grow us in our knowledge of you and, and the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ in whose name we pray. Amen. Okay.